Hello, and welcome to Explorer Classroom. My name is Jennifer Bergen, and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I am so happy to see you here today and welcome you to another Explorer Classroom. National Geographic believes in the power of exploration and wonder to change the world. This week on Explorer Classroom, we're taking a moment to show our appreciation for teachers all across the globe. Your work has never been more important or more apparent. This Teacher Appreciation Week, we're here to say we see you. Thank you for all you do for your students, your fellow educators, and for your communities each and every day. From all of us at the National Geographic Society, thank you. We are proud to support you and I am proud to be one of you. Here at Explorer Classroom, we love to connect with the heart of our National Geographic community, which is our explorers. This includes those who are working on the front lines of conservation, storytelling, research, and exploration. Today, we have a special presentation geared towards pre-K through second grade learners. However, curious people of all ages will be delighted to learn from today's featured explorer for a mini lesson and time to ask your questions. But before we get started, I'd like to give a shout out to some of our viewers tuning in today. From around the world, we have viewers coming in from Canada, Mexico, United Arab Emirates, the United Kingdom, Bulgaria, and India. And here in the United States, we have viewers from Pennsylvania, Maryland, Washington State, Washington DC, Kentucky, Nevada, Florida, South Carolina, Oregon, Texas, Virginia, Iowa, Georgia, California, New York, Wisconsin, Maine, Oklahoma, Massachusetts, Arizona, Alabama, Colorado, Maryland, Rhode Island, and more. Whew, a lot of you here. Now, I would like to introduce Maria Fadiman. Maria is an ethnobotanist, which means that she explores the relationships between people and plants. Maria is live today from Florida, where she's a professor at Florida Atlantic University. She's also a two-time TEDx speaker and a big fan of storytelling and dancing. Let's turn it over to Maria. Hi, I am so excited to be able to talk with you guys today. We have got a great thing coming up, looking at plants and people. So do I share my screen now? <laughs> okay, the technology I'm working on, the rest, y'all, we got it. Okay, so you're gonna watch me do, ooh, I'm feeling very impressive. Okay, you guys. Well, I am so excited because we are gonna talk about why plants matter. So that means that clearly we'll be talking about plants and we're also gonna talk about you. So the word ethnobotany, kind of a big word. So as, uh, as we were hearing, that's the relationship between people and these are some children sleeping in what looks like what you think it is. Yeah, that's a wheelbarrow in the Amazon in Ecuador. And we're also going to talk about plants. So this, if you look up, 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 this tall tree, I'm in the rainforest. And if we protect rainforest trees, we also protect what lives in them. So this is one of the animals that lives in the rainforest. This is a kawadi. This we found as a little baby and it was abandoned. And here it is, it's sleeping on my bed with me. That's my hand. It used to ride on my head when I would go walk in the forest. And then we got it to a place where it could then go back out to the wild. So we do wanna make sure that we keep wild animals wild. So we're gonna talk about how we use plants. But you know, sometimes you just make up how you use them. So. I work out in the rainforest in Ecuador and I work with a village and sometimes they would give me a little present when I left. Sometimes an egg, once they gave me a banana. One time after I've been working with them for a year, they gave me a really special present. They said, wait here, we have a special present for you. I said, okay. 
and they came out and they were holding a big duck. What? Clack, clack, clack. And I said, oh, thank you so much for this duck. And the problem is, is I had to walk eight hours through the rainforest, through the mud. <laughs> now I had to carry a duck? Well, Don Felipe, who was the person who was there, he was helping me, he said, <laughs> and he grabbed a leaf and he grabbed a vine and he wrapped up the duck and he tied it with the vine and he hooked it onto the back of his backpack. So for eight hours, I walked face to face with a duck. <laughs> and if you look in this picture, there is the duck. But the point is, he used a leaf and a vine. So he just made up how to use plants right on the spot. You can do that too. I'm also going to talk about how kids are teachers. So I was living in a different village out in the rainforest, and I used to take a burrow, like a donkey, to get in and out of the village to get to the city. Now, I was hanging out with this little girl. She was walking with me, and I was late. I was going to miss my burrow. And I turned around because I wanted her to hurry up, and this is what I saw. She was literally stopping to smell the flowers. And I realized she was teaching me how to notice, how to stop and look and see the plants that are all around you. So what are some other uses of plants? You can use it as face paint. This is a little achiote. And you can see we're painting each other's faces. This is in Ecuador. And you can make a bow and an arrow. Here I am in Africa. And you know what one of the best uses is? Swinging on a vine. Yahoo! That's a plant and that's a use. So that's ethnobotany. So there I am in Ecuador. Here's a different jungle in Ecuador. And you can also get medicine from plants. And so this is an Ashwar indigenous person. And you can find all kinds of medicines in the forest. But you know what? You don't have to go way out to the forest to find them. If you go into your medicine cabinet, maybe you have aspirin. Aspirin originally comes from the willow tree. Then there are some plants that have lots of uses. So I am in Africa, and this is a baobab tree, a big, tall tree. And one of the things that happens in this tree is bees make honey. And in order to get the honey, the local people put these little spikes in. They call them honey spikes. And you go up the tree, broop, Broop, broop. And there you can climb your tree. Now who's climbing the tree? Ah, Hadza boy who lives there. Who here likes to climb trees? Raise your hand if you like to climb trees. Yeah, me too. I just climbed this huge baobab. So take a minute and see if you can find me. There he is. Pretty fun to climb trees. It was really easy. And one of the things that the baobab also has is fruit. And you can make a delicious drink out of this fruit. And this little boy is looking at the drink being made and he's very excited. And this little boy is licking the last little bits of the baobab drink out of the bottom of the, the container in which they make it because it's so delicious. So we've been talking about a lot of plants that are far away, Africa, Ecuador, for some people, closer if you're in those places. And now we're gonna go to Tibet. This little girl is in Tibet. And there are plants that are similar, way far away to what we have in, in places in the United States, Europe, and many of the other places listed where all of you guys are listening from. What she's holding is a dandelion. Who has ever seen a dandelion? Raise your hand. Dandelions. When you have a dandelion, what do you do with it? You take it and you hold it and you blow. And when you blow, 
You also make a wish. A wish for having a weed because that's all they make. If you wish yes. for a weed, that's what you get. <laughs> exactly. So I'm hearing somebody who's chiming in, helping me out here. Um, so you blow and you make a wish, and that was a really good definition. So you see that that's something we do that she is also doing in Tibet. So we're really different, and we have different plants, which we also have plants that are the same, and we have a lot of things we do in common. So in some ways, we're all really very similar. Now, this is in Mexico. I know we've got a listener in Mexico, and this is a plant that I bet you guys have eaten, corn. Now what's happening here is I was living in Mexico and the grandmother of the house in which I was living, she would take the dry corn cobs and she would rub them together. <laughs> and all the corn kernels would drop off and fall into a blanket. And then she would gather them up and grind them and make them into tortillas. But if you look at this picture, there is a little boy hiding behind one of the corn sacks. Can you see him? Oh, there he is. So the grandmother walks out of the room and the little boy jumps out and wah, jumps into the corn, corn jumping. So that could also be ethnobotany. And you also might wanna think about that the next time you eat a tortilla. Mm. So one of the things I do with my work is I make a book of useful plants. And this is a way to save the information. So this one is written in Spanish. It's called Jardines de Salud. That would be the Gardens of Health. This was from Costa Rica. And I make a book. Anyone know how to say book in Spanish? Libro. So who here speaks Spanish? Oh, a lot of you. Great. The next, another book that we made in another place was in Africa. And these are plants used for dances. Now what you do with these is you use these plants to make ankle rattles. So you have them tied onto your ankle and then you jump and you dance and you rattle. And that's how you get your music and your dancing all in one. And they use the plants for that. Now this, the first language is Kiha. Kiha, that is a tribal language. And then we have it in Kiswahili. That's a language they speak throughout Tanzania. So these are African languages. So lots of you speak English, lots of you speak Spanish. Are there people, any of you out there who speak another language? Either you came from a different country, you're in from a different country, you're chiming in. Great, it's important to be able to speak all these languages to be able to talk to people and their plants. Good for you. So how did I get interested in this? Well, there I am when I am young. And I am playing cards and actually, you can see from the expression on my face, I am actually losing at cards. Yeah. But where am I? Well, the location is California, but the point is I'm in the trees. And then when I was a teenager, I actually got to sleep in the trees. My bed would hang from the tree and I would climb up my tree into the redwoods and sleep up there. And I knew one day, I wanted to work with trees. So one of the things that I do is I work with children who want to work with plants. So here we are, we're making a book in Tibet and we're using the plants that they know, but also we're teaching them how to ask or a word we use is interview their parents, grandparents, aunties and uncles about plants that they know. And then they made a book and they drew their own plants. So what about plants where you are? Aha, But you guys recognize this one. I'm about to take a huge bite of an apple. Yeah. I have an apple yeah. chip. Ooh, chocolate chips. So I'm these are the chips that I use to make my chocolate chip cookies, but these come from a plant. They come from a seed. Comes from the cacao plant. So this is where we get our chocolate. And this actually grows in a cauliflorous way. What? That's a weird word, sounds like cauliflower. But in this case, what it means is that the plant 
the fruit is attached to the trunk of the tree <clears throat> with a really thick stem. If you think most plants grow actually from a branch, they don't usually stick right out of the trunk. So this is a special way of growing. And if you see how big that fruit is, it's so it can be strong enough so the tree can hold it up. And you can actually eat the fruit around the chocolate. So the first time I had it, I was in the Amazon and a little Quechua indigenous boy was showing me how to eat it. He took the, the fruit and he smashed it against a tree and there was all this white goopy stuff. And he said, do you wanna try? And I said, no, that looks gross. And he said, take a little and I did. And it was so sweet and tangy and delicious. And then we spit the seeds all over the forest floor. What? The seeds were the chocolate. But unless it has some sugar, it's pretty bitter. So te broma cacao is the scientific name of chocolate. That sounds like a different language. It is. That's Latin. But what it means is food of the gods. Yay, chocolate. So maybe if you've been cooking things, you use cinnamon. Cinnamon comes from the bark of a tree. Now, if you're in the kitchen and you're doing all of this cooking, you might be doing a, what, a kitchen dance. Yeah. Who likes to dance? Raise your hand. If you really like to dance, raise two hands. All right, you guys ready to do a little dancing? We are gonna do a plant dance. And that means you do any kind of dance you want, but to think of a plant. All right, are we ready? You guys are the best plant dancers ever. That was great. All right. But what I'm doing in here, I'm actually dancing with a plant. What? Looks like a spoon, right? How could that be a plant? It's a wooden spoon. Comes from a tree. So there's plant items all around us, things that are connected to plants. Now, you guys are all ethnobotanists. Look around right where you are. Look to the right. Look to the left. Look up. Look down. You probably saw some plants. Somebody I see sees a table made out of wood. Somebody sees a house plant. Somebody is seeing trees out the window. Someone is seeing a pepper shaker. What? Pepper comes from a pepper tree. So for an activity, the idea is to look for plants like we just did, but do it throughout your whole house. And if you can, go outside wherever you are. Think of the use. Maybe you eat it. Maybe it's a flower, you look at it. Maybe it's the lawn, you sit on it. Maybe you climb. You could interview your parents or your grandparents or your aunties and uncles. And then you draw that plant. Think of its use. And if you draw another one tomorrow and another one the next day, you're making your own book of your own useful plants. So when we notice plants and their uses, we're more connected to them and we're much more likely to protect them. So we've been talking about a lot of faraway places. We've got the Philippines, Bhutan, Ecuador, how about the plants where you live? And I would love to hear all about them. So please reach out when you do. Thank you. You know, that makes a lot of sense because you make these beautiful books to give to the communities that you visit. Do you have any advice for a young explorer who wants to make their own plant books? So when you make your plant books, and a big thing of what I do is I make them and then I I make them with the community and I give them to the community. So it's wonderful if you get the opportunity, you do your own noticing and whatever kind of plant seems cool to you. And if you ask your parents, or your grandparents, or your great grandparents, you'll be surprised at the kind of information that they know. So this is an opportunity to ask them. They may not have had a chance to tell you until you sit them down and say, I'd really like to know what, what you know. And then when you make a book, it's also something you can give to them. And that can be pretty special. That does sound really special. 
Well, Maria, as you know, it's Teacher Appreciation Week. So for your final question, could you tell us about a teacher that's inspired you or has helped you along your career? Well, there's so many teachers I've had who've been so incredible in their, in their ways, but I'm gonna pick actually my first and second grade teachers. It was Flory and Elizabeth, and they really saw me for who I was. So I wasn't necessarily doing what everybody else was doing. And in fact, most of my grade just had them for first grade, but they kept me around for second grade as well with the same teachers. And they let me go at my own pace. And they let me explore beyond what was perhaps considered normal or expected. And with that, I really started to gain the confidence to explore what I wanted to, even if I didn't completely know how, that that was open to me. And they really supported me in that. Oh, that really like touches my teacher heart. I know that every teacher wants to help every single child on their path. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I am so inspired by you, Maria, and I hope that all of our viewers out there are just as inspired by her presentation. Thank you, Maria, for being a role model to young learners and for sharing your story with us today. Also, thank you to everyone who's joined us. I bet you want to explore plants more, and you can learn about exploration with us by visiting natgeoed.org backslash classroom. You can check out our schedule and register for more live shows and even sign up for an on-screen spot. Next week, we're going to return with another broadcast just for your age group. We're going to be talking with marine biologist Shane Garrow. So check out ways to get involved with the links in the description below and keep the conversation going on Twitter. Maria would really love to hear your thoughts. So tag her at Maria Fadiman, but also tag us at Nat Geo Education and use the hashtag Explorer Classroom. And of course, subscribe to our channel to get updates all about our new videos. I'd like to give one more thank you to the teachers who have joined us today for Explorer Classroom. We see you being teacher strong. And if you'd like to chat with other teachers in the community, feel free to tweet about your Explorer Classroom experience using hashtag teacher strong.